my name is Laurent Dubu. I'm an expert researcher with uh, EDF, the French power company, and I'm also uh, one of the co-founders of the World Energy and Metallurgy Council. And with uh, Swan and Hope, I'm also the co-chair of this uh, special interest group on uh, data exchange format and access. Um, just some rules for the webinar today. Sorry, I had lost my uh, mouse. So uh, the webinar is recorded to be made available on our website for those who can attend uh, today. Uh, the format would be the following. We will have three presentations of 15 minutes each, uh, after which we will have a question and answer session. So please, if you have questions, uh, type them uh, uh, as soon as they come in the questions panel. And while the presenters give their presentation, I will uh, put all of them in my presentation and share them on the screen at the end. The agenda, uh, so I will make a short introduction about the uh, WMC and the, the objective of the uh, Data Special Interest Group. Uh, then we will have three talks, the first one by Sewell and Oakt, who is a senior scientist and deputy director of the uh, Research Application Laboratory at NCAR uh, in the US, and she's also a co-founder and the director of education of the World Energy and Metallurgy Council and the fellow of the American Metallurgical Society. Uh, then we will have a second talk by uh, Mikhail Vestenov, who is the Managing Director of N4 AES, uh, Danish Society. And uh, then a third uh, presentation by Lars Peter Richogard, uh, who is the Vigos Project Manager of the World Metallurgical Organization. And then we'll have the question and answer session. So to start with, I'd like to introduce briefly the World Energy and Metallurgy Council. So it's a non-profit organization which was established in November 2015 uh, by Alberto Tucoli, Sullen Oak and myself. Uh, we now have a good team with uh, six people uh, under the uh, managing uh, director with Alberto Tucoli. Um, basically, the OMC goals are to uh, enable improved sustainable energy, resilience of energy infrastructure, and the efficiency of efficiency sorry, of energy systems. Uh, with a particular focus on a changing weather and climate. WMC is a professional association, but uh, its originality is that uh, the membership is free of charge. So it's very easy to become a member and we encourage you to do so, if not yet. Our activities are uh, shared between four, four main topics. Uh, one is about dissemination of information uh, via different channels, social media, newsletters, publications in scientific reviews, and so on. Uh, we also develop and maintain a climate and energy, and energy demonstration tools, and in particular, we are uh, developing a H2020 project and a Copernicus program uh, for the energy sector. We also organize uh, events, uh, the most important of them being the International Conference on Energy and Metallurgy. I will come back to that at the end. And uh, we do also project coordination and uh, special interest groups. Uh, the first two of these groups being this one on data, and the second one being on education. And it has, it has just been kicked off uh, a few days ago. I will skip the short video, but you will have the link in the presentation, which will be available after the, after the webinar, in which you have a three minutes presentation of WMC. Um, about the special interest groups, uh, so basically the idea of this is to uh, get some focus on particular aspects and to uh, take advantage of our large network of experts, uh, international experts so from all the continents, and uh, to bring all those people together to think about uh, solutions and uh, ways to uh, bridge the gaps in different uh, domains. Uh, so one of them uh, has been set up on, on data issues. The second one is on education. And we also have two other uh, groups that should start in the coming weeks or months. Uh, for the data exchange access and standard in particular, uh, the, the, the rationale behind that is that uh, data, of course, is key to design, build, and validate uh, effective products and services for the energy sector. And uh, on the one hand, we have the ometrological community, which is very well organized. Uh, for data sharing and data access and so on. And uh, uh, Lars will, will talk about that uh, in the last talk. Uh, on the energy side, it's not exactly the, the same level of achievement and there is a lot to do. And uh, that's why we decided to set up this, uh, this group uh, to try to uh, uh, make both communities talk together and to share the good practices, for instance. 
Um, in addition to um, probably uh, evaluate and develop best practices and so on, as, as written on the slide, probably one of the most important things we uh, think we can um, contribute to is to link and uh, uh, coordinate and establish bridges between already existing initiatives, because there exist uh, quite a, not a lot, but several initiatives in, in that direction, and we think that we can, we can play a role in this, in this aspect. Of course, for more information, you can refer to our website. Uh, so I will now uh, give the uh, microphone to Sue. Wonderful. So uh, thanks for those of you who are joining us here today. As Laurent said, I'm with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, as well as with together with Laurent and Alberto Trocoli being a director of, of WEMC. So, so glad that you're able to be with us uh, to talk about uh, data issues. Now, my perspective comes from having built forecasting systems, both for operational uses as well as doing research. And one thing that I found is that it really does take a community, beginning with the end user who has a need for a system that helps them run their energy system. And then on the far side, often very separated, is the basic research community that does research on meteorology, on energy practices, et cetera. But then the applied research community starts getting a bit closer to the end user. We need a funding organization that is able to provide the resources to that get us a little bit closer. Then we have operations that are doing monitoring, you know, producing in situ data. There's always some sort of computing operations running numerical weather prediction models, artificial intelligence models. But what really needs to happen to connect the research to the end user is some sort of operations translation communication. Now, when we um, worked on our DOE solar project, uh, we had a partnership that really com was comprised of public, pri uh, private, and academic partners, where we had end users telling us what they needed. We did have a funding organization, the Department of Energy's Sunshot Program at that time provided funding to NCAR, several other government labs, universities, to do the research on how to forecast better, working together with NOAA using both their operational monitoring and NWP computing, and also working with folks who regularly provide forecasts to the end user so that together we could come up with a system that met the needs. But it's not only the folks involved and it's not only the funding organization to do it well requires data. Now what we came up with on that project was actually a pretty complicated system that tested multiple ways of doing uh, forecasting. With on the top left here you see various numerical weather prediction models including um, a new version of WARF specific for solar forecasting. Um, we integrated multiple types of very short range forecasting methods ranging from satellite satellite methods, through artificial intelligence methods, through rapid NWP methods. Making predictions um, at both for both now casting and day ahead forecasting as well as longer term, producing components of the forecast, integrating those, and then converting to power, providing probabilistic information. But the thing I want you really to note here are the blue boxes. All of this 
requires observations and data, not only data from satellites and specialized instruments like sky imagers, but also ground-based meteorological observations as well as local observations that came from the utilities and ISOs that we were working with. Having that type of data is what we needed to enable a high quality, well-functioning system. So what type of um, observational data do we have? Again, as I mentioned, surface-based, satellite-based, some of our data is going to be gridded, for instance, from our numerical weather prediction model. Some of our data is point, um, you know, from weather stations. The satellite data is going to be pixel-based. You know, sometimes we bring in radar data, but that extra data from the site, not only the meteorological data, but also data on power um, is really critical to having good forecasts. These data are used for assimilating into the numerical weather prediction models, for training the artificial intelligence algorithms, for converting from the meteorological variables such as global horizontal irradiance or direct normal irradiance to power. The same is true for wind data. We want to convert from wind speed to power knowing um, that is important. Uh, we also need the current conditions that are measured for real-time operation of the AI algorithms, as well as for further correcting and providing probabilistic prediction. Um, at NCAR, we use an analog ensemble for that, again, trained on historical data. So what are the challenges? The data comes in very disparate forms. As I mentioned, some are point data, some are gridded data, some are pixel data. There's large volumes of data. Those of you who have downloaded satellite data or full NWP data have had to figure out how to winnow that down to a manageable amount of data. Even when we get very rapid time series data, how are we going to average that best for our uses? The data is complex. The formatting can be very different, and we need historical data sets if we're going to train our AI algorithms. Oftentimes, we don't have sufficient metadata. Um, not only do we need uh, the location, but we also need the altitude, lots of information about the type of monitor, the type of averaging, all that is important to make the data usable. One problem that we found in working with data is inconsistent timestamps. Okay, are we getting a, a UTC time versus a local time? If it's a local time, does it include changes for daylight savings in those parts of the world that go to daylight savings time? Time zone issues are important. In the US, some utilities span multiple time zones, and we've even observed that the time zone on the data depends on which time zone it's downloaded in rather than the location of the particular plant. These are the challenges that really make it difficult to work with the data. Sometimes we aren't even able to determine what time zone because of the insufficient metadata, and we need to plot the data and determine the phase shift shifts to even figure out the correct time zone. So it's critical to standardize data. Oftentimes, we don't have a sufficient amount of data uh, because they aren't stored, uh, because we don't have enough representation over the uh, extent of a farm, um, or we don't have extent geographically or in time. So these are all very much big data issues, and the impact of not dealing correctly with these, in, these data issues for forecasting, it can increase the cost. It means that software engineers are required to standardize the data to figure out what the metadata is to reformat it. it, it 
provides a lot of frustration and degrades the quality of forecasts if we do not have quality data. As I mentioned, it's important for data assimilation, training AI algorithms, initializing real-time algorithms, verifying models, um, real-time operation of the wind and solar plants. Um, oftentimes, as we're getting to optimize at the plant scale, having information about meteorological data as well as power production helps uh, the plant operators control the direction that the wind turbines uh, are in or even operation of solar plants by knowing information on temperatures, um, you know, exact cloud cover, etc. So even optimization at the ISO and RTO level, it becomes very important how to integrate the renewable resources. And it also eases computing in the cloud for faster, more accurate applications if the data are consistent and standardized. So as you can see, we're bringing in all these types of data in the meteorological community and especially in the applications in the energy interest industry. We've been working using the Internet of Things for a long period of time, bringing in all this real-time data, integrating it in ways that provide decision support. These data are critical want to show some positives of data sharing. When we have data and assimilate it into NWP models, various studies, including some that NCAR have, has done, have shown that the NWP model can do better when we have very local data. This shows assimilation of data um, at a wind farm. Um, on the top, you see the uh, mean absolute error. For the GFS in red, uh, the NAM, uh, you know, in green, and for our own uh, real-time four-dimensional data assimilation algorithm in blue, the RTFDDA is the only one that had the local wind farm data. And as you can see, the MAE was lower out to 18 hours because we were able to assimilate local data. And when you look at the bottom part of the plot, it shows the improvement of the RTFDDA over the baseline, which was the NAM. And we find that that improvement was statistically significant, again, out to you know, about 15, 16 hours. So having local data can provide significant improvements. Uh, NOAA has done some parallel research and found that when they have multiple data sources from wind farms, they're able to make publicly available forecasts um, better as well, and that benefits the entire community, including the renewable energy community. So what about standardization? As I say, a lot of the data that we get is not standardized. The WMO data are standardized, and I'm going to let Lars talk a little bit more about, but they've been standardizing data formats for a long time and have lots of experience in it. What we're suggesting here is that we develop standards that are also applicable for measurements at local sites. First of all, some recommendations is that we increase data sharing um, so that as the utilities, as the RTOs are increasing measurements at their site, that they start sharing their data with national centers so that the national centers can improve their forecasts for everybody, including the energy industry. Also recommend that we record meteorological variables at the same site as the utility data. That we make real-time data available because it is going to improve the quality of our forecasts, not only the NWP forecasts, but the very specific machine learning forecasts that are being delivered to the end user as well. We need to save our data. The historical data are valuable for training our machine learning algorithms, 
We need to standardize formats of the SCADA data as well as other utility and energy data. We need to record, record and standardize the metadata, the location, the instrument type, the maintenance details, the installation specifications, especially standardized timestamps. Use UTC standards as the meteorological community does. Also standardize location information and the organization and formatting of the data. And from our experience, we think that having these standards, having more data is going to improve things for everyone, especially for those end users in the energy industry. So thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so I will be uh, talking about a specific um, initiative uh, we have uh, initiated uh, within the EAA. Uh, task 36 um, in regards to standardization for communication uh, and describing a data interface uh, for renewable energy forecasting. Um, so uh, basically uh, what we're looking at now is uh, trying to, to streamline terminology uh, as well as uh, data communication uh, between forecast uh, providers and forecast users. Uh, uh, in this uh, context, uh, forecast providers are energy forecast providers and energy forecast users, uh, mainly within renewables. Um, the current situation is that we do not have a clear terminology and definitions of uh, the various uh, concepts, um, and there's no standard way of exchanging data. Uh, so uh, almost every setup between uh, a given forecast provider and given forecast user uh, basically needs to uh, define terminology as well as the data exchange. Um, so we have a very time-consuming uh, clarification process uh, with a risk of uh, misunderstanding each other. Uh, and we have uh, time-consuming and repet repetitive tasks uh, of setting up the data communication uh, between the forecast providers and the forecast users. So the initiative uh, tried to address this uh, in terms of uh, creating a well-defined terminology and definitions uh, and a standard way of exchanging data. Uh, basically, so time can be spent uh, understanding more complex and atypical uh, business requirements, uh, and we can spend time modeling and improving accuracy uh, of the forecast instead of data integration and uh, clarifying uh, terminology. Ultimately, uh, the goal is to uh, be able to provide uh, forecasts with high quality uh, at lower cost and making renewables uh, more competitive uh, that way. Um, so what we're trying to do is going to be fairly low practical uh, and pragmatic. Uh, so the focus uh, will be on creating a structure and create consistency in the terminology. So in terms of the structure, um, we will uh, are in the process of creating a structured data description, uh, which do allow for flexibility uh, using metadata. Uh, I'll get back to this in a second. Um, so uh, another key point I think is that we uh, currently aim at what I called 80-20% of user needs. I don't know if that's the exact uh, ratio, but the key point is that we probably will not be able to accommodate every uh, possible scenario, uh, but we rather focus on getting something out now fairly quickly uh, and, and uh, get the benefit of being able to utilize this on maybe 80% of the setups than having to do an enormous lengthy process um, and, and, and also uh, getting a much more complicated setup. Um, so the flexible framework uh, is, is envisioned to uh, allow for cost of information, but do this in a standard structure. Um, obviously there will be some trade-off uh, between uh, having something which is very consistent and something where you have an ideal data structure for the specific setup. Uh, so basically, um, I mean, depending on, on the data which needs to be transmitted, you can of course sit down and model and make an ideal data structure for that specific setup, uh, but then again you would lose the consistency. And this initiative is focusing on in consistency rather than and say having an ideal data structure for the specific setup. 
Um, we are focusing on uh, or aiming at getting two levels of standardization here. Uh, one which um, talks more to the terminology, uh, which is creating a logical layer, defining the terminology, and grouping information into logical entities uh, with relevant parameter, parameters. And then a more, you can say, detailed level of standardization, where the goal is to uh, have a you can say, specific detailed data structure and data transfer protocol, which can be uh, directly operational. Whereas the first layer will be more kind of a business layer for communication between people. Um, the idea is actually that people can decide just to standardize to one of these levels. Um, and uh, but, but obviously the, the biggest benefit will come from uh, doing both levels of, of standardizations, uh, which would, should make a new forecast um, a setups almost uh, plug and play. Um, the development process we envision for doing this is that we uh, encourage uh, forecast providers and forecast users, mainly energy companies, utilities, uh, to join the work. Uh, we do also in, uh, would like uh, other organizations and uh, academia to join, uh, but for right now the most important for us is to, to get the, say, the two entities which are going to be interfacing with each other. Um, we will have uh, a key working group uh, as well as uh, associate reviewers and it's also possible just to join us as, as a follower if you just want to follow what's going on without actually want to spend time contributing or, or reviewing. Um, we need to uh, develop, which we do not have yet, a structured process for developing, reviewing and releasing new versions of the standard. This is not something I have a lot of experience with, so um, I would uh, welcome anybody who would like to join who uh, either want to uh, do that, uh, handle that part of the process or have the experience uh, they can share with us. Um, we want to review existing and related standards uh, to see if we can find inspiration. Uh, this is and going to be a little bit of a trend, uh, um, a balance between spending a lot of time reviewing a lot of complicated standards uh, and, 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 and compromises trying to get something out the door fairly quickly. Uh, we are part of the, uh, as I mentioned, the EA uh, task uh, 36, where this is uh, actually a sub sub task um, focusing on the standardization work. Uh, and we will also be coordinating with other relevant in initiatives. Um, there's one uh, sponsored by uh, the Department of Energy in the US for uh, carrying out uh, trials of solar power forecasting, um, where we will be coordinating this initiative with them. Um, with that standard, uh, standard uh, interface uh, they are going to use in their platform. Uh, the status and next steps are that we have done the first initial uh, draft for the logical layer and the first reviewers uh, are currently uh, looking at it uh, and providing uh, input. Uh, anybody who's interested can reach out to me, uh, get a copy and also provide input. Then we just started on uh, actually defining the more detailed data structure and data, uh, data transfer protocol. Uh, and uh, I'm in the process of also creating some examples uh, to um, say, um, which will be part of the, the, the standard uh, to, to kind of show how the wording should be interpreted. Um, and we have the first academics, forecast providers and utilities joining the group, but more is definitely needed. So again, please reach out uh, if you're interested. My contact details will be in the end of the presentation. Um, then uh, for the logical layer, uh, currently we have, uh, you can say, the main uh, logical entities are defined and their logical relationships. I'll show you in a second, which is basically right now we have sites, turbines, measurements, which consist of settlement data and, and real-time measurements. We have future availability, also called schedules, and we have the, you can say, the result of, of the whole uh, exercise, the forecasts. Um, and then we have defined parameters, um, uh, for each of these uh, entities. And we're working with parameters as either mandatory or optional uh, to provide some flexibility in the setup. Um, in terms of the data specification transfer protocol, uh, we're gonna, of course, replicate uh, the data structure, which is uh, expressed in the logical layer. Uh, we have some initial thoughts now on data fields, names, and formats, which are being kind of captured in the document we're developing. Uh, as mentioned, we're in the process of uh, developing example files 
and are currently contemplating on supporting uh, FTP slash F SFTP as well as uh, web services, uh, most likely using a REST API for the web services and CSV and JSON file for for the FTP transfer. JSON file will also be, uh, and actually also CSV can also be supported on the web services. Um, the logical layer, uh, just a quick overview of where we are. As I mentioned, we have these uh, three main categories of data, and then we have the metadata uh, layer. Um, and I'll just spend a little bit of time on the metadata layer. Um, as uh, the idea here is that uh, we'll have something called a forecast specification, uh, which will uh, basically describe the rest of the data. Uh, so uh, describe the, for example, the time time format uh, used, uh, time zone, uh, the units in the measurements, and so forth. So you can kind of understand uh, what the data uh, actually is by reading the metadata. And the idea is to create one metadata file, which is uh, the standard, but then also the ability to change in this uh, metadata file if you want to deviate from the standard. And this is where the flexibility comes from. So in fact, Sam, there can be one parameter in the metadata file, uh, say called um, forecast uh, file time zone, and then uh, a parameter uh, indicating the time zone. And the standard would be UTC, but you can then go and change that uh, to uh, could be central uh, European time, for example. Uh, and in theory, you could also expand the metadata description with uh, additional parameters, which is not included in the standard. But then again, you have a structured way of, of doing it. So this is the way we want to um, try to uh, to capture both standardizing things, but also providing a methodology for, um, for flexibility. Uh, so basically, that was uh, it. Uh, questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer after the presentation. And if you're interested in being part of the initiative, uh, P, please uh, feel free to uh, to reach out to me on my contact information. Uh, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to this. Uh, I'm Lars Peter Lisaga, responsible for the coordination of, of uh, the WMO Integrated uh, Global Observing System, or WIGOS. Uh, I won't say too much about that, but uh, I will stay sort of at a fairly high level and uh, talk to you about why uh, observational data exchange is needed and what is the role of WMO in, in, in that particular game. I could say a lot of different things about uh, what we do, and, and uh, Sue mentioned uh, that we, we indeed do a lot of work in standardization. We do uh, a lot of work in metadata standards. Uh, but I'm not going to be delving into that. I'm, I'm simply focusing on, on uh, the uh, on the exchange part of the equation because this is so important. Uh, this is such an important uh, part of what we do, and it is not always understood why we do it or how important it really is. So at the highest level, why do we exchange in, uh, observations? Uh, those of you who are meteorologists uh, probably already know that, uh, but uh, my guess is that uh, you probably all aren't of the field. So I'm, I just have a couple of examples here that uh, that uh, try to illustrate the importance of it. So the first one is uh, an illustration of what you need in terms of observational data coverage to do uh, forecast, weather forecasting at various ranges. So I'm hoping you can see sort of uh, North America down uh, down here, uh, and you can see uh, the continent, the lower 48 states of, of uh, the United States here. And the innermost area is what you need to cover with observational data to do a one-day forecast. No surprises there. All of North America, a good chunk of the Pacific, a little bit of the Atlantic. If you want to do it further out, two to four days, then you already have over half the Northern Hemisphere and a little bit of the Southern Hemisphere that you need to cover. And if you want to go out five to seven days, which is what we routinely do now, you essentially have a global observational problem on your hand. And the important thing to understand here is that this is not unique to North America. You could put this map anywhere on the uh, on the globe and it would look sort of broadly similar. What that means is that it doesn't matter whether you sit in Beijing or in Washington or in Sydney, uh, you need the same observational data, even if you care about the forecast only for a very specific local area. You essentially need observations from all over the globe because that is how the atmosphere is working and that is how uh, numerical models of the atmosphere are working. And we can back this up with uh, anecdotal evidence. So ECMWF 
have told us that a lack of observations down here uh, over what they call the tropical warm pool, so basically Papua New Guinea and uh, the Solomon Islands and, and the Coral Sea, they can trace a lack of observations down here uh, over to degraded uh, forecasts uh, a week later of uh, Western Europe, which is the primary constituency of, of uh, East and WF. So, generally speaking, a lack of observations anywhere uh, limits our ability to understand and predict uh, climate and weather uh, patterns everywhere. So, we need uh, observations from the whole globe. It's in our world, it's a truism. It's something that you, you hear again and again, especially in, in a UN agency like a WMO, that meteorology knows no boundaries. So it doesn't care about national boundaries. But the corollary that I've tried to, to illustrate here is that in meteorology, ignorance knows no boundaries either. So if you are ignorant about the weather in a certain specific part of the world, uh, in other words, if, if there's a lack of observations, it's going to come back to bite you wherever you are at, at uh, some later point in time. And that is, uh, there's nothing new in this. This was realized many years ago, and it was behind the creation of, of uh, the World Weather Watch uh, back in uh, around 1960, which I think is probably the most important uh, program that WMO has, uh, has created. Uh, and it has been a fantastic example of international collaboration for, uh, for more than 50 years. It's been a fantastic example of international uh, collaboration, not because meteorologists are better people than, uh, than uh, any other uh, scientists or any other professions, really. It, is just, uh, it just so happens that we cannot do our work without it, as, as I tried to, uh, to illustrate on, on the previous slide. So the World Weather Watch has uh, three components to it, uh, the global observing system, the global telecommunication systems, and the global data processing and forecast system. And I'll talk primarily on number one. Number two, the GTS, uh, now being superseded by the, the WMO information system, is how we transport uh, the observations around the, the, the globe. And number three is to translate that into uh, something that is closer to useful information in, in, in terms of numerical weather prediction product, as, as also mentioned by, uh, by Sue. So the global observing system is what exactly? It's a highly heterogeneous mix of the tens of thousands of uh, stations uh, of all kinds, radars, lidars, classical weather stations, automated weather stations, uh, radio on balloon stations, uh, aircraft, ships, buoys, and uh, a good number of satellites operated by around 15 satellite agencies around the world that provide weather observations that are distributed to all WMO member states in uh, real time. Um, sometimes within hours, increasingly within minutes after the, uh, the uh, actual time of the observation. And it is absolutely fundamental uh, to any uh, attempt of, of uh, predicting the weather uh, and increasingly also any attempt to analyze the climate. Uh, we shouldn't overlook the importance uh, for climate uh, as well. And what exactly is WMO's role in this? Uh, we're an agency, we're a secretariat here in Geneva. We don't make any observations, actually. The observations themselves are, are taken by, by uh, um, uh, the weather services of uh, our 193 members, uh, a number of research agencies, uh, international organizations that are uh, uh, active in the ocean, uh, the space agencies, both national and, and international. So a very large mix of, of, uh, of entities are responsible for actually acquiring the observations. What we do is we regulate uh, um, and we manage what is being measured, uh, where and how often. So that's the standardization role that, that, that Sue uh, referenced uh, and how it is be, uh, being exchanged internationally. Uh, why do this via the UN? Well, I tried to convince you on the first chart that there are, there are roughly 200 countries uh, in the world. Uh, and in principle, each of these 200 countries uh, needs the observations from the other uh, 199 countries. It would be spectacularly inefficient to do this via bilateral agreements. Uh, do the math and you find that it would uh, require close to 20,000 uh, individual bilateral agreements. Nobody wants to do that, uh, so that's why this is being orchestrated in, in, um, uh, under the auspices of, uh, of a UN agency. And that's actually why we are meeting, uh, what we're meeting about uh, in these two weeks here. We are just wrapping up uh, the WMO Congress, uh, which is a two-week event that runs every four years, where delegations from all our 
193, uh, to be precise, member states get together and, and uh, make all the strategic decisions. And this is where they, uh, they uh, sign the agreements also on these uh, international data exchange uh, uh, systems. Uh, in addition to that, we evaluate the performance of the observing systems and we provide uh, guidance uh, uh, on uh, where we see this going next. I want to say a little bit about uh, regional versus global exchange of, uh, of observational data because, because I think that, uh, or I got a sense that uh, what, what, um, what Sue was talking about is at a much finer scale than uh, what I've talked about here, at least in, in, the, uh, in the first part of the presentation. But I, I want to acknowledge that we are active also in uh, facilitating regional exchange of observations. So what we call the ARBON, the Regional Basic Observing uh, Network, is a uh, network that sets up regional, uh, in some cases just bilateral, and in some cases truly regional exchange of a wide range of observational data uh, for many different purposes, uh, weather, climate, uh, atmospheric composition, uh, hydrology, etc., etc. This is not very tightly specified. So this is where WMO acts with a very soft stick. Uh, so there, for those of you who are familiar with regulatory material, there, there's a lot of the word should in that rather than the word shall. Uh, shall is legally binding, should is more uh, sort of advisory. Um, and the reason for that is that often neighboring countries are those who tend not necessarily to get along and are perhaps not terribly excited about exchanging in particular radar data and other hydrological data. So this network is specified and, and designed uh, and implemented individually by our six uh, WMO regions. Uh, and uh, it was just updated and, and adapted as part of the WIGOS regulatory material uh, last Friday. Then we have the Global Basic Observing Network, which is um, something that has a lot more teeth to it. Uh, it is to support uh, global NWP primarily, which is truly a global uh, application that benefits all member uh, states around the globe and that, as I said, requires a global data set. The primary focus of, uh, of the g bond is surface pressure data and uh, upper air data, so vertical profiles of um, temperature and in particular wind uh, acquired by aircraft and, and uh, by uh, radio sound observations. Uh, there is a satellite component uh, to this as well. That is not formally part of GPON. Uh, this is orchestrated through the collaboration that we have uh, via the Coordination Group for Meteorological Satellites with the, the 15 or so space agencies that I mentioned. The GBON, as I said, has more teeth to it. It has mandatory spatial resolution and mandatory reporting uh, frequency, and it is designed, defined, and monitored at a global level, not individually by the regions. Why do we need this? You would think that uh, this is so well understood by all the WMO members that they would just be good uh, uh, international citizens and, and uh, take the observations and exchange the data per uh, requirements. Unfortunately, it is not quite that simple. We have a system that monitors this 24-7, uh, so every uh, six hours we can get a generate a map like this that shows the amount of, uh, in this case, surface pressure observations that are being exchanged globally uh, and made available to NWP centers around the world. I don't want to go into the uh, detailed description of the colors here, but uh, suffice it to say that the green dots represent uh, stations that are fully functioning and that are exchanging everything that uh, WMO guidance say that they should. Uh, the orange ones uh, are somewhat functioning. They're just not reporting at a high enough temporal frequency. And the black ones are the stations that we didn't hear from uh, at all during this particular reporting period. The white areas, obviously, there are, there are no stations. Um, so the fact that not all areas are green or have a reasonable density of green stations uh, amounts to a tremendous uh, amount of lost opportunity for the WMO members to do a better job in terms of issuing forecasts and warning warnings and climate analysis and climate guidance products. So uh, WMO Congress and, and the, the WMO Executive Council uh, were worried enough about this that they actually uh, approved GBON as a concept uh, also last Friday uh, as a WMO initiative to attempt to not only turn this data coverage uh, map green, but also to fill in uh, some of the most egregious white areas with, uh, with more, uh, more green dots. 
So it represents uh, a new, uh, renewed uh, WMO commitment to something that uh, WMO has said uh, for many years that it was doing, namely to supply adequate observational input to global MWP. Uh, but now uh, WMO is putting some teeth into its regulations to actually ensure that this will happen. It will, as everything else, uh, be implemented not by OSI and the Secretariat, by, uh, but by uh, the individual WMO members. Members with a capital M in WMO speak means countries, uh, and uh, some countries can do this very easily. Uh, recall the green areas of, of the map, this, would, this uh, is de facto implemented already. Japan, Western Europe, and uh, uh, big chunks of South America are already green, so they don't need to do anything in particular. There are big countries, in particular you, uh, the US and China, that have enough uh, uh, observations available to comply with this tomorrow, but they are just not currently exchanging them at uh, a high enough temporal frequency and in some cases not at a high enough spatial resolution. They don't need to do anything uh, in particular in terms of getting new uh, observations, but they do need to uh, um, update their data exchange practices and in some cases perhaps even their national data policies. And then there are a number of members, as always in, in WMO, who do not have uh, the national resources available to meet this. And we are working uh, very closely with the World Bank and the Green Climate Fund and, and some of the other international, both multilateral and, and uh, bilateral development organizations to fund this, in particular in the, the Pacific and, and um, uh, in Africa and other developing countries. Uh, we have an estimate of uh, what the price tag would be to uh, to uh, make uh, big steps toward turning this map green. It seems like a lot of money, but in the um, in in the grand scheme of things, in in comparison to what the World Bank and the Green Climate Fund are spending on these types of issues, it's actually not that much money. So we're talking about a capital investment of three hundred and fifty million dollars and annual operating costs of one hundred and fifty million dollars above and beyond what. Uh, the WMO members already today spend on the global observing system, which is somewhere in between two and five billion dollars per year. It's a little bit difficult uh, to come up with a solid estimate of what is being spent today because uh, there are almost 200 countries involved in it with uh, all kinds of different accounting methods and, and, and different way of, of uh, funding and managing this. But uh, those are the sorts of numbers that, uh, that we're talking about. So in summary, International data exchange is essential for absolutely everything we do, and we have uh, been doing this since the 1960s. Uh, uh, some data are exchanged globally, others are, extensed, uh, are exchanged only regionally or bilaterally, uh, or in some cases not at all, uh, and it depends on uh, what applications they are targeting for. You're talking about renewable energy uh, here, so a lot of what you are engaged in is actually national data exchange and perhaps data exchange across different agencies uh, uh, within the same country. Uh, WMO is very active in providing guidance for that sort of stuff as well, but that is not uh, what I have chosen to focus on in, in, in this presentation. So uh, if I have missed the boats uh, here slightly, I apologize for that. I was not tremendously familiar with the organizations prior to uh, to engaging in, in, in this webinar, but uh, I hope I've, I've given you at least a flavor of uh, what we are doing and uh, why we do it. So I'll stop here and, and thanks for the time. Thank you, La. No, I think your presentation was great. Uh, and it's good to illustrate the difference, uh, at least from my point of view, the difference there is uh, between the metallurgy community and the energy community, because in the metallurgy case, you have, uh, as you clearly showed, some physical constraints that absolutely uh, make it, uh, yeah, really necessary to share data because what happens on one part of the uh, of the earth uh, has impacts on other parts of the earth a few days later. So there's a physical constraint there which obliged a meteorological institute to share data. Uh, it's not exactly the case in, in the energy sector, and I, I think there's something like a, a lack of incentive to, to share data uh, in, in, that, in that situation. So, you know, your, your, your talk was really great. Thank you. Um, so we'll now uh, go to questions. I will probably ask all the speakers to open their microphones now. I, I put the, the questions here uh, when, they were, when, when they came, in the order they came. Uh, so first one, as usual, is uh, about the, the, the availability of the slides. 
after the meeting. So in principle, yes, they will be, uh, except if any speaker has any uh, uh, restriction according to that. But in general, we put all the presentation as PDFs on our website. And uh, I will just remind you that the, the webinar is also recorded and that the recording will be available on the website as well uh, in the uh, resources uh, part of the OMC website. Uh, second question from Lionel, I think. Uh, how does WMC rely or follow GEO's recommendations on interoperability and standards for search, discovery, and access to metadata and data? So it's a, it's a very accurate uh, question. Um, as I, I, I think I can answer this one, uh, or maybe so could also, but uh, um, basically uh, we, we do not intend to implement recommendation or whatever. and. Uh, just keep in mind that WMC is here as a catalyst for the discussions. We want to uh, uh, bring people to talk together and so on. And we we uh, we are not especially um, those who implement the, uh, the those recommendations. Uh, but as I, I need also to say that we are working with people from Geos and especially from uh, with your colleagues from from Armin Lionel, uh, with uh, Thierry Enchant's team and so on. And so in what we do for Copernicus program, for instance, uh, we try to follow the, these recommendations as best as we can. I don't know if any of the speakers want to add uh, a response to that in, in, in their particular case. I would take this as a, as a no. I hope this answers your question, but we can, we can keep in touch later if you want. Um, we then have a question for Sue. Is data privacy also an issue which needs to be addressed in the cases you presented? That's a great question to bring up. And yes, data privacy is an issue. Um, and that's why we suggest that there could be a forum where if you're contributing private data, that perhaps it goes into a national center who can be a trusted, um, third party who protects those data, make sure that the data itself does not become available widely, but that it does get used well in making forecasts better. And we realize that in working with the private sector that privacy really is an issue, um, but we think the benefits of disclosing your data at least to the national centers become so important that that transcends the privacy issue. And, uh, you know, again, if you have concerns about privacy, uh, non-disclosure agreements could be signed with the national centers that you're providing them to. And of course, um, you know, we expect that any private organization is already sharing data with their own um, forecast providers. That's really a necessary piece of doing a high quality forecast. And in that case, the forecast providers, although they use data to make better forecasts overall, they are keeping those data very confidential so that it does does not um, become available to any folks that you don't want it to become available. So I think we can get around the data privacy by signing NDAs with the groups you're sharing data with. And we may find that it's important enough to share data that uh, privacy really isn't as big an issue as many folks think it is. That uh, you know the good of the all um, becomes more important than the privacy issue when your competitor shares their information. It not only makes their forecast better, it makes your forecast better too. And, and the same when you share yours. And uh, you know, so it, as far as the national agencies that make um, the, the base forecast, they need as many pieces of data as they can get, and then your forecast provider can can then make a better forecast for your particular site using their methods that are really tuned to your site. So I, I personally think that uh, the good of the all transcends the privacy, but we can deal with privacy via NDAs. Uh, the next one was, uh, does anyone want to add something? 
Uh, yeah, Laurent, I, I would offer a WMO perspective on this. It's an extremely important issue, and Sue is absolutely right that uh, uh, just so, sort of from a moral or philosophical standpoint, the good of the all should prevail. It is a huge issue in WMO uh, now, not just not so much because of the privacy issue, but because of the realization of the uh, enormous Im economic importance of, of uh, meteorological data products. When um, uh, some governments and many private uh, companies, when they hear the word economic value, they think of commercial value. And there are uh, data providers who are not they're not concerned about privacy, they're concerned about making money on the observations and uh, they will try to carve out a niche for themselves in that. So they're not big fans of, of, uh, of data sharing, obviously. If, if, you, if you've given away something, you can't sell it, that's obvious. But not only are they concerned about not giving away their data, they are actively lobbying their governments to stop our international data sharing practices because we are, they, they, they perceive that we are ruining their a potential market that they could develop for, for selling observations. So it's a huge issue for WMO uh, that, um, they, and for the WMO members for the weather services around the, the globe. So I, I just wanted to flag that it's not just a question of privacy. It, it, it's, a, it's really a question about uh, the value of it. Of, of it information and we will be forced to undertake an overhaul of our data policies in, in, in view of, of, uh, of, of the interest of the private sector angles. Okay, thanks for this compliment. Uh, next one was not a question but was our a comment and Yonen, I will make you uh, able to speak if you'd like to briefly explain what you meant with this uh, climate and forecast convention. Of course, that meteorologists know if you want to just make a comment. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, that was uh, based on the second speech. I probably I don't remember the name of the speaker who was... Michael. Uh, yeah. Michael, uh, yeah, sorry for this. Uh, was uh, mentioning some, or at least questioning some practices in order to deal with uh, encoding a certain type of uh, resources uh, based on metadata standards. And this climate and forecast convention I know it's a bit specific to certain type of format, which may not cover all the need, but at least for a net CDF type of format, we have experiment encoding a net CDF file following climate and forecast convention with, a, let's say, quite a, a good covering. Uh, it has been mentioned that there is trade off that need to be to be accepted, but uh, dealing with uh, solar radiation. Uh, parameters based on climate and focus convention, which I provide the link here, could be also a good type of trade-off of a community who has already do the job of trying to to tackle such type of way of, of formally naming, uh, let's say, physical parameters in certain domain. Okay, thank you for this clarification. And indeed, they, it, we are clearly in the in the context of the, the goals of the Special Interest Group, which is to uh, bring people together from both communities, so energy and meteorology, and to make them exchange information because there's so much information on both sides. And indeed, those uh, climate and focus conventions uh, could be probably useful for the energy sector and, and, and we should reinforce the links and share the information about that. And thanks for making this point. And uh, the next one was also more a comment uh, rather than a question. I would ask to uh, Olivier to comment on his, on his remark as well, briefly. Uh, yeah, okay. Hello. Uh, so uh, I'm Olivier N from uh, N Suisse with the uh, European Organization Association uh, for Transmission System Operator in Europe. And of, uh, obviously, as, as you mentioned in several presentations, uh, the transmission system operator needs the uh, uh, forecast data, uh, the meteorological data to do uh, the energy forecast. Uh, so we are uh, currently using it. And the new thing is that with the uh, network costs, which are the legislation in Europe, uh, we have to um, uh, use them uh, for pan-European processes uh, because we are uh, more and more coordinating uh, between countries, between TSOs. Uh, to have pan-European processes uh, that take into account this uh, uh, weather forecast, so for example, for the adequacy forecast. Um, so we are uh, we need to do some data exchange between uh, the, the the TSOs, and we have some um, data exchange standard for that uh, that are based on the common information model that is uh, an IEC standard. And my question was 
uh, to I think it was a third speaker uh, uh, if uh, this was something that was investigated uh, and and to see what were the link uh, between what you are uh, producing as a standard and if if it was uh, done in collaboration also with uh, IEC, which is the international uh, standardization body for electrotechnical uh, uh, field. Uh, so that, that that was my question. Okay, um, I can give a short answer to that. Uh, I simply don't know. Uh, we are uh, divided uh, roughly in, in uh, two parts here in WMO. The infrastructure, which is the uh, observations and the data exchange, and the services side of the house. So that that's uh, the services side of the house uh, serves all the different uh, user constituencies, uh, and they have uh, certain standards and protocols, obviously, for the reasons that you just mentioned. Uh, but I simply don't know that uh, much about it because I, I work uh, on the infrastructure side, uh, so the uh, upstream part of it, unfortunately. If you write to me, uh, I'm happy to forward your question, but I cannot answer it myself. Okay, thanks, Olivier. Uh, yeah, the discussion is going on, I think, and will continue. Uh, then we have a question, maybe for for you, Lars, of some of someone who would like to hear about comments on how to deal with data quality in a standard way, so from the methodological perspective, and maybe Michael has some uh, ideas for the uh, energy perspective. Then. Sorry, uh, what was the question? Um, uh, someone, I think it was uh, Banujit, who wanted to hear comments on how to deal with data quality in a standard way. So I think WMO has a huge experience in that. Yes, um, the overall, uh, I mean, as Sue said, uh, we, we have uh, been setting standard uh, for many, many years uh, in terms of how things should be measured and uh, where they should be measured, how stations should be sited, and uh, at what altitude of the, above the ground various parameters should be measured, that, that kind of thing. The modern philosophy uh, between uh, be, behind WIGOS now is that we, we tend to be much more inclusive uh, for reasons that are rather obvious. Uh, meteorological observations used to be um, somewhat specialized and, and requiring some uh, not advanced instrumentation, but uh, be done by technically knowledgeable people with somewhat specialized instrumentation. That uh, So it was uh, done by national weather services and relatively easy to standardize. That paradigm is largely going away now. Uh, many of us have, uh, most of us have smartphones with barometers in them, and they also have uh, GPS. Uh, so if you get a pressure uh, measurement at a three-dimensional uh, three coordinate location, that's a meteorologically valuable observation. Many of us drive cars that have thermometers and um, rain sensors in them and internet connectivity. Those are also mobile observing platforms. Uh, and those are just two extreme examples. Everybody has, not everybody, but there, there, there's just a heterogeneity of uh, information out there available uh, that is not really amenable to any standardization, but we can still make use of it. So the modern practice is that we uh, uh, that uh, we uh, follow a very strict uh, metadata standard. So everything in principle can be included in WIGOS as long as we get the requisite uh, data to go along with it. And then it is up to the user to make uh, an informed decision about what um, application, uh, what uh, types of observations are valuable or usable for what type of application. So we tend to uh, focus a lot more on the metadata standard and the metadata repository now than really enforcing uh, standards on, on, uh, on the observations themselves. We, we still maintain very high quality metrological, metrologically as opposed to meteorologically uh, 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 traceable uh, observing network, but that is increasingly a very small subset of, 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 of the whole plethora of, of, of observing networks. Okay, thanks. Uh, Miguel, do you want to have an energy perspective on that? or? Well, I mean, um, I, th I think the only thing I, I got to, to add is, um, I mean, I, mean I, I guess data quality is, is two things, right? One is, um, I mean, understanding the data, and another thing is then also, um, I mean, if, if, if the measurements are, are then correct, 
Um, and, and I think we, we are trying to address at least the first part in terms of uh, understanding the data you get and, and ensuring that I mean, the people who, who send the data and the people who receive the data understand the data in the same way. Uh, in, in terms of actually ensuring the, you can say, if the measurements you then receive are, are correct and validate kind of the magnitudes and, and, and so forth, uh, I, I don't know if I have some anything uh, particularly interesting to add. Uh, I mean, um, okay. On, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. Sue, Sue, unfortunately, had to leave because she had an, another, another meeting, but uh, I, I guess this is something she has in mind when she said that we need uh, metadata. Uh, of course, metadata includes location, timestamps, and so on, as she described, but it also in, includes uh, at least some information on the quality of the data. Uh, the, for instance, the type of sensor which was used, and so on. So I guess I guess yes, the answer is yes, uh, as well for the uh, for the energy data. Uh, well, we will take this last one. Uh, the last one was from me at the beginning because there were no, there were no much question at the beginning, but then they came, uh, and and in fact it it can be linked to question seven as well. Uh, uh, for country with uh, missing metallurgical station, uh, are there any methods to collect or produce solar data? By solar data, I mean probably uh, irradiance or solar radiation data and so on. So, last, do you want to take it, please? Yeah, I can. I can do that. Um, there are cloud climatologies out there. I mean, it, it's it's not it's not that complicated. Uh, you need to know uh, where you are, what latitude you uh, you are at, and then you need to know something about. Uh, um, to first order the cloud uh, distribution, then of course the ozone distribution is somewhat important as well. But there are cloud cl climatologies available, and they are to a very large extent driven by satellite data, and uh, that can be very valuable for for these applications. The satellites see everything, whether you have uh, meteorological stations or not. The quality will be a little bit more limited when you don't have ground truth, but for for cloudiness, they are actually very good. Okay, thanks. And just so this question was asked by uh, Bian, Bian Pambe, sorry for the pronunciation, if it's not good. Uh, in case you want to know more about that, you can send me an email. I will put my email address at the end and, and I can put you in contact with, with some specific people who are dealing with this kind of data as well. Uh, so I, I had put the last one. Uh, maybe Lars, you could comment on that. Sorry. Um, in, in case we are, there's no observation, ground observation or satellite observations available, uh, even if satellite observation by definition are, are available almost everywhere. But when there's no ground observation available, is it a, a WMO recommendation to use ground analysis products or any kind of the generated products? Uh, of course, the beauty of, of uh, reanalysis is that it has an opinion on the climate everywhere. Uh, that that is the power of numerical models, but uh, you also need to understand that uh, in areas where you don't feed observational data into it, uh, the quality will suffer. Uh, so the reanalysis is not as good over Papua New Guinea as it is over Western Europe, simply because there are no local data that are put into to the models there. And there are actually ways of demonstrating this. Uh, there is scientific literature that demonstrates that, that uh, the reanalysis uncertainty is much, much higher over the Pacific than it is over the inhabited uh, areas of, of, of the world. So yes, you can use it everywhere, but, uh, but understand uh, that, uh, that uh, the quality is not, even though the, the, the product looks uniform all over, the uh, all over the globe, the quality of the product is not the same everywhere. Yeah, okay, thanks. So yeah, it's better than nothing, but uh, ground observation is also better. We we'll agree on that, I think. So we are getting to the end of the questions. We went a little bit further than uh, six, uh, but the, the seminar was booked until 6.15, so it's fine. Uh, with that, I would like to close this webinar by reminding you um, that the World Energy and Meteorology Council is organizing soon its sixth international conference, Energy and Meteorology. Uh, which will be in Copenhagen, Denmark, from 24th to 27th June, with a pre-conference seminar on the 23rd, on the Monday. Uh, it's still time to register, of course. Uh, the program is now uh, entirely determined, and it's really exciting, so I would uh, like to invite you to join, if not done yet, and we will be happy to meet you there. Uh, please notice that there will be one of the workshops during the, during the conference, which will be dedicated to data issues, 
uh, in which uh, Sue will uh, will talk again together with uh, Shanti Maitia from uh, who's retired from National Grid in the, in the UK. And there will be some group activities, uh, probably very very interesting. Um, and with this, I'd like to uh, close this webinar. In case you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, and I can either put you in contact with uh, with other people who attended the webinar, or other people who have uh, who have some answers to your specific questions. Uh, and of course, uh, we always invite you to join WMC as a member. Remember, it's free of charge, and uh, uh, by doing so, you will integrate the network uh, at the international level and be able to share your expertise or to ask questions to other experts in the world. I would like to uh, finally thank all our speakers for their contributions and their times, and to thank uh, all of you for your uh, attendance today. Uh, the, as, again, the, the, the recording of the webinar will be available on our website uh, in a couple of weeks at most. And uh, thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. <laughs>